Thank you for joining me for this seminar as part of the Biological Engineering Collaboratory Seminar Series for 2020. What I'll be doing with my time is taking the opportunity to explain to you all what I see when I look at the BEC. I've written the paper with an emphasis on being methodical so that I can bring as many people with me as possible, whilst also making the landscape as clear and attractive as I can to others who might also be thinking of researching biological engineering. There are two things I need to explain before I start. First, the seven types that I advertised, these have become six types and a contrast class for reasons that will become clear later on. Second, I want to explain the structure of the paper because I'm not building a particular argument, but rather offering a way in which to see things. The first half of the paper will be spent walking up the side of a decently sized hill, using some steps which I've put in place. For some of you, this approach might feel much too slow and lumbering, but it's easier than simply trying to jump to the top. And doing it this way increases the number of people who might make it. The trek is worth your time because of the view awaiting us. We're going to be able to look out on something which I hope you will agree is vast and inviting, offering enough work for several lifetimes. We're going to see all the myriad possibilities which biological engineering makes available. This will be the midpoint of the talk. From there, we then get to go back down again, using the ride that I've installed for the purposes of exploration. It goes up and down, side to side, taking us through lots of the different areas, and hopefully you'll find it fun. It also lets us cover a great deal of the landscape pretty systematically. So that's what we're going to do. To begin, I need a whiteboard. The very first step up the hill is this one. Everybody watching this video will be interested in the subject of knowers and what they make. Some will be interested in the philosophy of knowers and what they make, others the history of knowers and what they make, others the social study of knowers and what they make. There are all sorts of potential knowers and makers, farmers, artists, lawyers, doctors, civil servants, priests, etc, etc. The vast majority of the people watching this video will have training concerning one subgroup in particular that is science. Most of us will have been trained in the philosophy, history and social study of science. A smaller part of this audience will have also attended to an alternative subgroup, that of engineers and engineering. Here, a very common scholarly meeting point is the work of Walter Vincenti, no doubt the most famous and influential advocate for engineering knowledge. When it comes to the philosophy of engineering, some of you might immediately think of Claude Levi Strauss, Others, the pragmatism of John Dewey or Herb Simon. More recent philosophers who have attended to engineering include, of course, Mika Boone, who presented earlier in this seminar series, also Peter Crowes and Nancy Nassessian. The most active meeting point for philosophical attention to engineering is the Forum for the Philosophy of Engineering and Technology. There, the work that Zachary Pertle does, as both a philosopher and an engineer, is of great value to us all and could be developed far further. For the history of engineering, we can think with a wide range of studies, including, for instance, Amy Slayton on US engineering education and race, Amy Subix's work on engineering education and gender, Patrick McRae's recent study of engineering collaborations with artists, Chego Sarajevo's new monograph on Portuguese engineering, Ajantha Subramanian's work on how caste structures entwined with British colonisation influenced engineering education in India, or the work of Catherine Olesko on 18th century engineers in the Prussian frontier, amongst many more besides. Lastly, for social study of engineering, Gary Downey's expansive body of research is available to us. I've benefited in particular from Caitlin Wiley's work on engineering socialization in the classroom. And some social science research projects have attended to engineering identities encompassing queerness, national identity, educational background, and so on. Much of this research, and more besides, can be found in the journal Engineering Studies. So these are some of our foundational steps for the journey. Importantly, they incorporate reflection on the racial, gendered, heteronormative, class and colonial constituents of engineering and engineering knowledge in the past and present. I emphasise this at the outset so that people working on engineering cases from the widest possible range of analytical perspectives know that I am keen to learn from them, and also so that those of you building cases 
know that there is an expectation for these features to have directly informed your analysis, at least to some degree. The next set of steps concern how to think with these three disciplinary approaches together. For those who are interested in philosophy and only philosophy, then you might be seeking something of an integration of analyses of engineering and science. So the picture becomes this. This approach would see engineering cases given as much due care and attention as those in the sciences, which would be a good thing, while further, uh, furthering pre-existing philosophical research programmes concerning ontology, epistemology, metaphysics, and so on. In some of Mika Boone's work, for instance, it sometimes seems the case that engineering is set to be assimilated into the philosophy of science. Other times in her work, engineering knowledge seems to require more autonomy. By contrast, another member of the BEC, Terry Bristol, thinks that philosophy of science needs to be subsumed by engineering and overall attention to an engineering worldview. Meanwhile, Bill Wimsatt has argued that aspects of the organisation of knowledge in engineering should inspire a reform of the organisation of knowledge in philosophy. These are, of course, not the only options available to philosophers of science. And as I mentioned, Boone does not always seem to adopt an integrative stance. Knowing of these possible agendas helps to sharpen the question of how philosophy is or isn't meant to be integrating analyses of science and engineering. This in turn has implications for philosophy's possible integrative ambitions with historical and social scientific research. Because, by contrast, if you're first and foremost a historian or social scientist, then your understanding of the goal will likely be different. It would look more like this. Historians and social scientists who work in this mode have good reasons to keep engineering and science's potential distinctions close to hand, at least at the outset of their inquiry, for the very simple reason that our actors hold on to such distinctions. Actors come through training in the one or the other, or both. Publics and policymakers regard them distinctly. Different things are expected from them. They have different demographics. Their workspaces are different. They're funded largely distinctly, etc., etc. However, even here, and knowing that historians and social scientists will often need to think of them in parallel, this does not preclude the possibility that there will be some phenomena exhibited by both, or some aspect of both, which might be managed or analysed by the same means. So they too can sometimes pursue something that is more integrative. All of which brings us here. Sometimes engineering and science require independent and specialised parallel analysis, and this is true for philosophers, historians and social scientists. Sometimes they can be treated as amenable to a more unifying analysis, and this is true for philosophers, historians and social scientists. The key points for all of this setup are to emphasise the need to increase attention to engineering and engineering knowledge, to highlight the challenges that this entails, we need to pay attention to the intended scope of our different research programmes, while also articulating some of the different ultimate goals which the BEC can serve. It is here that we want to get emphasise, as we saw in the work, some of the work I referenced earlier, attention to the importance of gender, sexuality, race, colonialism, of the global geographies of science and engineering, and so on, to make sure these are baked in from the start. We're halfway up the hill. Thus far, I've spoken at the level of science and engineering. Again, I'm being methodical in order to bring as many people along with me as possible. In order to begin making case studies, we need to become narrower. For me and for the BEC, the way to make case studies is with biology. But of course, everything I've said thus far applies to any and all sciences or forms of engineering, be they biological or otherwise. The fact that it is biology, as a particular science, which I am taking towards an amorphous engineering, rather than some particular form of engineering being taken to a general collection of biological sciences, is due simply to my own intellectual biography. Biology is what I know more about, so I start from there and work outward. More particularly, I was introduced to the intersection of biology and engineering through my time on the Engineering Life Project working with Jane Calvert, Emma Pro, and Pablo Schifter, all of whom I may remain very grateful to for what they taught me about engineers and engineering knowledge. Again, these are facts about me, not facts about what work needs to be done. 
I would love to see more work on engineering knowledge, regardless of biological connections. The organization of a chemical engineering collaboratory or a physical engineering collaboratory, for instance, would all be worthwhile. With all of that, then, we arrive at what I mean when I say biological engineering. It is attention to intersections of biology and engineering by historians, philosophers, and social scientists, building on broader analyses of science and engineering within the wider and more general investigation of knowers and what they make. While I think that the way I have just put biological engineering together is novel, at least in its clarity and interdisciplinarity, I am, of course, far from the first person to arrive at biological engineering by whatever means. Some of the people whose work I've already referenced have themselves already given more specific attention to biological engineering. To put it another way, the BEC had to exist before it could be formed. I first made this slide for the 2019 Oslo meeting of ISH, at which Janella Rob and I formed a panel on biological engineering and then decided to form the BEC. Perhaps some of you were there. I like this slide because it offers you some photographic portals into the existing communities of historians, philosophers, and social scientists invested in biological engineering, all on their own terms, with nothing to do with me. Of course, these photos are only narrow portals and don't capture all the existing researchers we might call on. For historical study of biological engineering, this would at least include Robert Budd, Helen Curry, Louis Campos, Mike Dietrich, Sabine Holler, David Munns, and Jane Meinschein. Further people will be referenced in what follows, and there are more besides. For philosophical study of biological engineering, this would include Bill Wimsat, Brett Colcott, Sandra Mitchell, Nancy Nassassian, Janella Baxter, and Mika Boone. Again, further people will be referenced in what follows, and there are more besides. Last, for social scientific study, we can start with Calvert, Froh and Shifter and build from there through what is already a sizable community, including Sam Weiss Evans, Megan Palmer, Rob Smith, Miriam Quigley and Anna Delgado. Once again, further people will, will be referenced in what follows and there are many more besides. However, in my effort to be methodical, I also found two features which problematise this view of biological engineering. There are two other very closely aligned objects of intellectual attention that we at least need to be cognizant of, of when pursuing biological engineering, even if we don't always pursue them at the same time. For starters, some of the people that I'm invoking through these photographic portals, and indeed some of you viewing this video, more typically, typically think of themselves as really being interested in biological technology, while a further set might be more interested in biological organisms and materials as features of the environment. Therefore, if we are being truly methodical, which I think is important for community building as much as it is for thinking clearly, then we would need to replicate all of the steps that I've just gone through for biological, biological engineering, but also for biological technology and environmental engineering. Briefly, that would look like this. So that technology enters as a third alternative focal point, which you can see here in the gray box. And so that our science box explicitly incorporates examples that are more environmental or ecological in the red text there. I obviously cannot now list all the historians, philosophers, and social scientists of technology or the environment, which we would here need to incorporate. I will simply offer some entry points. For starters, a special mention must go to the community of researchers already dedicated to technoscience, which, thanks in, in particular to our previous seminar speaker, Alfred Nordman, has already flourished as a site of historical, philosophical, and social scientific research all of which either implicitly or explicitly directly informs engineering knowledge without covering it as a synonym. The inclusion of technology also allows us to stretch back many hundreds of years before something like engineering as a professional and pedag pedagogical institution that we recognize today ever came to be formed, including research on guilds, artisans, crafts, etc. in medieval and early modern worlds or in Francis Bacon's distinction between works of fruit and works of light. Looking at the transmission of technical knowledge as researched by people like Pamela Smith, Jenny Bolstrode, or Ursula Klein, and so on. Indeed, it was in the context of biology and technology 
that Dan Liu su suggested using Pamela Smith's work on maker knowledge in more biological contexts, and much more can be done in this direction. For environmental cases, engineering professions and epistemologies might matter for investigations of environmental planning and management, but they also might not. Work currently underway through the Envirotech Special Interest Group of the Society for History of Technology exemplifies some of what goes on here, as does the recent volume on intersections of technology and environment by John Agar and Jacob Ward. Also, Mike Dietrich and Laura Lovett's short chapter on the history of ecological engineering, Valentina Marchicelli's STS research into the practices of astrobiology, Sharon Kingland and David Munn's respective research on phytotrons, and Sarah Vaughan's social scientific research on mangrove forest engineering. Again, I am being far from comprehensive, but just sharing enough to give you more of the overall landscape. As we continue walking steadily up the hillside, we're very nearly at the top now, we would also need to find more photographic portals, equivalent to those which we were offered earlier for biological engineering. In doing so, we would no doubt find some people who overlap across two or three of these focal points, but the three communities as a whole would nevertheless be different. Even though I want to focus on biological engineering, I need to, to explain these two other focal points for a couple of reasons. First, because technology is not synonymous with engineering, we can draw a rough distinction between studies which are primarily interested in the use and making of things, but which do not bring in the figure of the engineer or the possibility of engineering knowledge, and those that do. In addition, there are, of course, times and places where biological technology needs to be understood as part of biological engineering, particularly if one recognises the emergence of biotechnology in the 1970s and 80s as one form of the larger and longer phenomena of biological engineering, as one would be one way to interpret Robert Budd's uses of life. The historiography of biotechnology has recently been studied in depth by Nathan Crow, work which you can find through the BEC website. As for environmental options, these matter not only because they are interesting in their own right, but because the analysis of biological engineering should also be scalable across labs and fields, across the local and the global. When Julia Burston and Katie Kendig presented their research into agricultural science in this seminar series, for instance, we would lose something if we did not think of the biological as one and the same time the environmental. All right, thank you all very much for your patience. We're now at the top of the hill. If you think I'm trying to fit people into certain boxes and fix everything in place, I promise that isn't my intention. I'm intending to offer a view of things, one that I hope will be clear and attractive to a wide and growing number of people. Remembering this, the distinctions between all those options will help to mitigate against the occlusion of engineering and engineering knowledge by technology or science. For me, it's deeply problematic to let technological objects stand in as testament to some engineering work or knowledge, just as it is dangerous to let theories or hypotheses stand in for scientific work and knowledge. The final part of my talk is for those who might fancy working together in a landscape like the one I've just described. The final part of my talk concerns the six types of biological engineering and the additional contrast class which you came to hear about in the first place. I offer these as means to travel around the landscape. The six types include engineering found in biology, engineering done with biology, engineering done to or for biology, engineering learning from biology, biology learning from engineering, and biology learning with engineering. The contrast class is that of making. Initially, I interpreted this as one of the seven types, but it quickly outgrew the others for reasons to do with the overall picture that I've already unpacked. We need making to cover the widest possible context of our research programme, while we need the six types to cover the more specific intersections of biology and engineering. These then are the seven means by which historians, philosophers and social scientists can study biological engineering together. They are the waypoints for a track which I've installed on the hillside. Each of you might provide the energy for this ride by different methods. Some of you might go and gather evidence from laboratory ethnographies. 
some of you by reading scientific articles, some of you by completing oral histories or semi-structured interviews. For myself, what I'll do to get around this landscape is go to the archive. The observant amongst you will notice that time has passed since I was recording the previous section. To begin with, the history of the biological sciences can be told as one of learning how to make more and more things, things which might be valuable in their own right, or which might help to expand research programs by incorporating them into experimentation. For a short list of examples, consider polio vaccine in the kidneys of monkeys, new plant varieties, animal breeds and microbial colonies, tobacco mosaic virus in a test tube, the synthesizing of amino acids from starting materials, tissue culture techniques as have been studied in particular by Hannah Landecker, the synthesizing of DNA and genes, radioactive traces, hybridized DNA, model and experimental organisms, new artificial media for silkworms, as has been studied by Lisa Onaga, or the making of artificial cell membranes, as have been studied by Dan Liu. This approach to understanding biological change over time through what gets made has already been developed clearly by a few different historians and philosophers of science. Classic case studies concern objects such as laboratory mice and rats, attended to by Karen Rader, in part through the lens of the historiography of technology and more recently by Dmitry Melnikov through the Straussian notion of bricolage. I would also mention here Helen Curry's paper paralleling the history of DIY garage technologists with DIY bioscience cultures and competitions, both in the past and present. For more philosophical treatments, we could think with Janella Baxter's argument for the use of modified or orthogonal transfer RNA in the causal accounts which scientists develop, or we could pursue the line of inquiry developed by Massimiliano Simons, building on Jean-Francois Lyotard's understanding of making things work. We could also think with Julia Burston's work on the making of kinds as something that happens at different scales, requiring us to give greater attention to the descriptions offered by scientists and engineers, a biological example of which we already have in the form of Melinda Bonifagan's work on stem cells. Thinking also with STS, which has its own wide variety of existing interests in maker cultures, we can of course think with those who have attended to DOY biolabs, such as Anna Delgado. In short, making will sometimes implicate engineers and engineering knowledge, and so it needs incorporating into our agenda. But it will not always implicate engineers and engineering knowledge. Having it as a contrast class recognises its multiple or possible significances, as well as helping us to think more clearly in the narrower study of biological engineering. For the first type of biological engineering, consider engineering found in biology. For a short list of examples, consider all the examples of cells being described as factories or as whole industrial economies, discussion of amino acids as building blocks, parts of the cell being described as units and subunits, ribosomes as the cells factories, descriptions of plants as living machines, or the world's vegetation being one big nitrogen pump. Physiologists such as A.V. Hill working on what is exemplified here as living machinery. Parts of organisms being drawn and represented much like engineering schematics, exemplified here by representation of TMB replication attention to molecular architecture, the notion of doctors as engineers for the body, nature as a large textiles industry, chlorophyll as a semiconductor, flagella as propulsion mechanisms, or biological systems that operate like thermostats, exemplified here uh, with James Daniele's hypothesis of a possible homeostat controlling cellular development. Again, some of this has been explored by historians, philosophers, and social scientists, particularly by those with an interest in metaphor, but we can and should push much further. If biologists have been appreciating evolved things as modular for decades, with metaphysical implications that have begun to be addressed by Katie Kendig, and if systems biology can grow up in pursuit of constraint-based generalities, as Sarah Green has argued, and if synthetic biologists can pursue how possibly models of biology for their own sake, as has been attended to by Rami Koskinen, then we have good grounds for suspecting that a nascent epistemology styled on or sharing features 
more typically found in engineering contexts, has been present in biology for much longer than is currently appreciated. Here is where historians of biology would expect reference to Philip Pauli's work on Jack Loeb in his book, Controlling Life. But I'll only mention that at the end here because I think it otherwise risks making Loeb into something of an outlier. Bits of Loeb have lurked in many times and in many minds, even if they rarely emerge quite so completely. For the second type of biological engineering, consider engineering done with biology. For examples, consider penicillin or animal feedstuffs from microbes grown in industrial fermentation tanks, as have been studied by Robert Budd, or the use of bacteria to make valuable industrial inputs from sewage or waste, utopian schemes to bring farming to an end forever by growing everything that we might need in controlled industrial centres, the role of microbiologists ensuring up and making safe national economies, as in the case of Koji manufacture, studied recently by Victoria Lee, or the reorganisation of entire agricultural supply chains to serve some larger industrial end, as was Beres Charmley's interpretation of agricultural genetics, an analysis which he modelled on Thomas Hughes's notion of the large technological system. Or you could consider plans to use animals as industrial workers, exemplified here by the suggestion from experimental psychologists in the mid 20th century to train pigeons to detect defective pharmaceuticals. Or we could focus on the more recent ambitions expressed by many in synthetic biology to treat biological organisms and materials as part of a full-fledged engineering enterprise, which I'm illustrating here with an example of their commitment to design build test cycles. For this second type of biological engineering, we might be interested in the kinds of biological knowledge which engineers need in order to make their processes work, the ways biologists themselves learn that they can contribute to larger industrial processes, and how the world of engineering makes demands on biological organisms and materials. We also know that various different elements of what I've just described also have a public life, which we need to attend to the history of, whilst also remaining up to date on the state of the art in public engagement. Here we can think with the work of Robert Meckin and Andy Balmer on everyday engagement, also Claire Maris's analysis of the various phobic stances which scientists and engineers often adopt in relation to publics. And of course, all the promises which have been attendant on biological engineering in the past and present, whether these are the promises for altering genomes as explored by Janella Baxter in her BEC seminar, or economic and development policies, as have been studied by Alberto Aparizio, or its particular governance problems, as have been studied by Deborah Scott, Rob Smith, Lolita Sundaram, amongst others. For the third type of biological engineering, consider engineering done to or for biology. For a short list of examples, consider much of agricultural engineering, which has to co-produce outcomes with organisms. We can also think of milking machinery, or the development of rubber belts for potato harvesting and other automatic equipment that has to be designed with the particular features of the organism in mind, exemplified here with a scheme for automating most of pig farming. Likewise, machinery made for the human organism by biomedical engineers, who in the UK were the largest force behind the first biological engineering society. The integration of humans and medical equ equipment are already studied by the likes of Jill Haddow and Murren Quigley through the figure of the everyday cyborg. Meanwhile, Nancy Nassessian has already given attention to the kinds of training and pedagogical problems which confront biomedical tissue engineers. And Nikki Vermeulen has led research on the possibility of 3D printing biological tissues. We could also think of studies of the soil, an object that asks us to reconsider what we treat as biological in our cases given the variety of physical and chemical features which directly impinge upon plant growth and which are embodied by the soil. Here the work of Anna Kozanski can help guide us. Some other examples of engineering done to biology will be accidental, as in, for instance, the case of industrial pollutants being investigated for their physiological effects. And here we can incorporate the work of Michelle Murphy. Particularly in agricultural cases, these examples of biological engineering 
are going to incorporate prejudices and assumptions about the fitness of organisms and about the productivity of different landscapes around the world and the people that populate them. We will therefore need to incorporate critical analyses of the kinds of productivism which have been expected of different nation states and critical analyses of development policies as they've changed over time. Likewise, in cases of biomedical engineering, our actors are going to incorporate prejudices and assumptions about the proper role of the patient in contrast with that of the engineer. This in turn means that disability history and disability studies ought to be amongst our guides. And for these purposes, the work of Jai Verdi and Corinne Maguire, two historians of disability and technology, are high on my reading list. For the fourth type of biological engineering, consider engineering learning from biology. For examples, consider ambitions for chemical or biochemical computing, exemplified here in the middle through the work of Stafford Beer, attempting to make networks with algae. Or think of the predictions made by the likes of Norbert Wiener or Alexander Todd, who as early as the 1960s believed that nucleic acids were set to become important engineering materials thanks to the amount of information which nucleic acid polynucleotides can retain. Further examples, including the significance of attending to biological membranes for engineers in the microelectronics industry, have been studied in detail by Matthias Grote. We can also think of organic nervous systems inspiring new kinds of machines, exemplified here by Heinz van Forester's use of work on cat neurons to inspire new kinds of computation. Or we could think of the properties of organic materials, inspiring new kinds of industrial materials for engineers and material scientists. Exemplified here through a case of engineers and applied mathematicians studying how dandelion seeds fly. We can, of course, also add the entire enterprise of biomimetics and examples of art architects and designers claiming inspiration from things in nature. What distinguishes all these examples from the previous types is that engineers and designers retain control of the epistemic context, with our focus being on their own pursuit of knowledge. Yes, as in the earlier examples, economic and industrial considerations can matter here, but we retain this type of biological engineering because it takes into consideration the more narrow development of engineering knowledge. For the fifth type of biological engineering, consider biology learning from engineering. Many of the examples which I gave in the previous section concerning engineering learning from biology can here have the arrow reversed, making them newly significant for biology learning from engineering. For some new specific examples, consider C.H. Waddington's views on the need for biological scientists to learn from cybernetics, or biologists choosing to represent regulatory networks according to the same diagrammatic principles that engineers use for their networks, or paleontologists using engineering knowledge to understand possible models for dinosaur flight, and the kinds of reliance on engineers displayed by morphologists, which has been attended to by Marco Tamburini. We could also consider the prior training that key biologists, such as John Maynard Smith, had in engineering before turning to biology, which in turn mattered greatly for their popularization efforts, as has been addressed by Helen Peel. In this context, synthetic biology looms large once again. Now in the hands of those scientists, you do not go so far as to say that it is engineering, but at least accept that it is modelled on and inspired by engineering. Here, work on epistemic competition by Friedland Gross, Nina Kranke, and Robert Munier, who spoke earlier in the BAC seminar series, gives historians, philosophers, and social scientists a more fine-grained means to carve up the biological sciences in the first place. In addition, Andrea Lotkas and Tarja Nutella have shown how the problematizing of noise in synthetic biology gives back to biologists some sense in which their subject does reach the limits of engineering even as they intend to overcome those limits. Outside of synthetic biology, we can consider the likes of Robert Kennedy, another figure who Robert Budd has already alerted us to, who had a broad and deep conception of the challenges that biological engineering faced at the levels of community and pedagogy, which he hoped to help overcome by forming the first biological engineering society. I think for most people, this is the type of biological engineering 
which inspires the most immediate attention. I would like for it to be seen in the larger context that I'm offering so that our historical, philosophical and social scientific accounts do not close down what might need to be opened up. For the sixth and final type of biological engineering, consider biology learning with engineering. This type distinguishes itself from the previous because it allows for a shared existence between engineering and biology, but one that does not imply a particular direction of travel for knowledge exchange. They're both existing at the same time can simply produce opportunities of its own. For a short list of examples, consider how in 1956, biochemical engineering was formed as part of the engineering faculty when established at UCL, pictured here more recently. Pedagogically, this department placed an emphasis on unit operations, as was already standard for those teaching industrial engineering. Or think of the development of new equipment, be they microscopes or computers or synthesizers, which can be incorporated into experimental systems, exemplified here by a contemporary confocal microscope. For these, we could return to Alok Srivastava's paper in this seminar series, in which he emphasised how new disciplines grow up around initial artisanal insights, insights furnished by directly working on materials in ways that depend on and inspire new instrumentation. Likewise, we could think of the incorporation of automation into biological labs, which can change their overall workflows and design of experiments, as has been investigated by Chris Mullingwood, through his innovative analytical lens of the amphibious researcher. In all of the above, the technologies themselves matter, but so do too does where they come from, how they get to the lab, and how they come to be inspired in the first place. For me, the most significant reason to remember this type of biological engineering is because it reminds us of that large mass of people who have to develop biological knowledge and relationships because they intend to make things for and of use to biologists. Such engineers and salespeople I attended to in my own paper on the history of DNA synthesis. And for the historian, philosopher and social scientist studying engineering and science, they offer a great deal more. Okay, so I've now told you loads of things and I hope you found some of them interesting. I very much look forward to speaking to you all in the question period or by correspondence if you'd like to get in touch. I suppose my main conclusion is that the BEC is a good thing, and I'm very proud to be working with Janella Baxter and Rob Spith to make, continue making it happen, and with all of you to support and inspire as many intellectual lines of inquiry as we possibly can. Thank you.